Support for the podcast series Forgotten Prison comes from Gonzaga Law School and its Center for Civil and Human Rights, dedicated to enriching the educational experience of students and contributing to the practice of civil and human rights. Details at gonzaga.edu slash law. Thanks to Humanities Washington for their generous grant. It was summer on McNeil Island, late August. The year was 1895, and John and Petra Holm had something to celebrate. Petra had just given birth to a boy. This was her first son after three daughters. But within a year, their joy was gone. The little boy died before his first birthday. The family buried him on their property, up on a hill overlooking South Puget Sound. They planted four trees there to mark the site. More than a century later, on a late fall day, Paula and I climbed up that hill. So there's a a marker for the grave, a rock really, and it has a plaque on it that says, Edwin William Holm, August 1895 to May 1896. The Holm family were pioneers on the island. Like other settlers in the late 1800s, it meant they were also living near the federal prison. The parties coexisted for decades. But then, in the 1930s, the federal government and the new Bureau of Prisons decided the settlers had to leave, that the island should be restricted to people connected to the prison. For the Holmes, it would mean leaving behind the grave, never to be able to visit it again. The feds had determined it would be impossible to dig it up and move it because the roots of those madrona trees, so the story goes, had grown entangled around the coffin. So an agreement was struck. The family did leave, but were given special permission to come to the island and visit Edwin's grave whenever they wanted. They took great care to save the, that grave so that the relatives could continue to visit. Well, and I realize this trail, tire tracks come up right about to where my car is now. If you know where the trail is, it's pretty... Yeah. Oh, people time. do. They said their family does come to visit. Even though the prison is closed and the island is still off limits to the public, descendants of the home family can still come here. We're only here because of this project with the Washington State History Museum. I think we're up this way. I think so. I think we went this way. The site is referred to as Four Trees in all kinds of official paperwork. It was even included in the agreement with the feds when the state took over McNeil Island. It's a remarkable testament, really, this official government recognition of a family's loss. But there's another grave site on the island. I can hear the raindrops on my microphone. (laughs) So these are, uh, were inmates buried here? I believe so. An old prison cemetery on McNeil is in the middle of the island. It's marked by a short rock wall around the perimeter. When you step in, you see simple stone grave markers in somewhat uneven lines. Our guide is Eric Heinitz. He's with the Department of Corrections. There's only numbers. The numbers are all covered in moss. Prison cemeteries aren't exactly uncommon, but this one is unusual. The markers have no names, just numbers. At first, you think they're inmate numbers because that seems like a thing prisons might do. But the numbers are sequential, and they're low. One, two, three, ten, eleven, twelve. From what we can tell, it's just the order that prisoners died in. And I'm not so sure that there's people buried where the headstones are, um, if they're actually corresponding with graves or not. What Eric is saying is, short of digging the whole thing up, there's no way to identify who these people were. If there ever even was a list matching inmates to numbers on the headstones, no one's been able to find it. There are 125 unnamed headstones in this graveyard, placed here sometime during the century or so the feds ran the place. Each one of them, as far as we know, corresponding to one person whose identity seems lost forever. KNKX and the Washington State History Museum, this is Forgotten Prison. I'm Paula Whistle. And I'm Simona Alicea.
We spend a lot of time on this podcast talking about what McNeil Island and the prison's 136-year history can tell us about how and why we lock people up. But one obvious thing that makes it unique is that it's on an island, accessible even now only by special government foot ferry or barge. Hi. Hi. Guys, you want me to just put, a, put set them in the back seat yeah. if you roll your window down? Oh, sure. Okay. So these are our life vests? Yes, ma'am. One morning, Paul and I got permission to drive our car onto one of the barges that goes from Silicon on the mainland over to McNeil Island. You've probably seen barges piled with gravel being pushed by tugboats out on the sound. This was like that, only with cars on it. As you might guess, neither of us had ever yeah. traveled on a barge. Yeah. I mean, this is pretty rudimentary, what we're, what we're on right now. I mean, this is pretty much like the basics of uh, the physics of flotation. <laughs> It's a parking lot. It's a floating parking lot. But a small parking lot. Yes. <laughs> yes. It's like a small gas station parking lot. Oh, I think we're on the move. Oh, we're moving. It's like we're gonna like we're driving on the water. As we head towards McNeil Island, we can see the Tacoma Narrows Bridge yeah. to the north. I that view of the narrows is just it's like, like it, the Golden Gate yeah, Bridge it feels like or the something. Golden Gate, yeah. Like it feels big and important, especially with the like with the mountains kind of in the fog. I'm starting to think it's just pretty here. When someone doing work on McNeil needs to get their vehicle there, this is how they do it. That was true for people who worked at the prison until it closed in 2011, and it's true for people who work with the Special Commitment Center today. But on our trip over, we were also thinking about inmates who were transported to the prison when it was operating. You know, I'm here right in the front of the boat, looking out of my windshield and prison is just getting closer and closer and closer. Someone we talked to was talking about who arrived by what they called the chain bus, mm -hmm. chained on his way to prison here, was talking about it being the waters being rough and it being quite scary. Well, and you're up if you're in a bus, you're high up. And then mm -hmm. if you're shackled and you look out and see the water and know if anything happens, you probably aren't going to be able to get that life jacket on. right? Yeah. Someone else I talked to said, um, they, they put life jackets on them, but he was cuffed to a guy. He was chained to a guy who was like twice his size and used a cane. It's kind of magical getting to drive around the island. Alcatraz, when you think about it, is just a rock in San Francisco Bay. McNeil Island is nothing like that. It's big enough that we actually got lost a couple of times. We were surrounded by dense forest. With the prison out of sight, it's kind of easy to bask in the quiet beauty of this place, to listen to the waves and the birds, or pick a perfectly red apple from the old orchard. With the prison out of sight, it's easy to be at peace. As we were driving around McNeil, we could see various signs of the island's history. There are the old graves from when it was a federal prison, the boarded up homes where prison guards' families lived through its time as a state prison, and like the four trees grave on top of that hill overlooking Puget Sound, there's evidence of the white settlers who came before the prison. So this is, this is house number one? This is the 110 house. 110 house. Um, and this was the house that my bootlegging great-grandpa lived in. Sarah Kimmel is descended from some of the first white settlers on McNeil, and it's actually her great-great-grandfather who built and lived in this house on a somewhat remote corner of the island across from Key Peninsula. This looks like a super secret shine room if I ever saw one. Yeah. <laughs> shine, that's short for moonshine. My dad swears there's like hollow walls in this house. I wouldn't be surprised. Sarah's ancestor is John Lohr, and she says he was known for running booze around the South Sound during Prohibition. Let's rewind for a second. From what we can tell, Native American tribes historically used the island as a place to fish, hunt, and trade. White settlements appeared well before the prison was built. And for the most part, they coexisted peacefully. In John Lure's case, there were tensions. That's because he was making and selling booze under the nose of the federal government while it was operating a prison 
that was practically next door. Anytime the feds would stop him, because he always had his briefcases or suitcases full of shine, but anytime they stopped him, miraculously, it was only full of laundry. So I don't know how he got his tip-offs. I don't know. I think he was constantly a thorn in their side that, hey, we're trying to run a prison here, and we have this guy that lives here, and he's making and selling shine. I think it probably didn't look that good. <laughs> Well, and presumably selling it to the people who worked here. Oh, totally. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He he had to have had a good um, customer base here. And then over in Stellicum, too, he would row across every day with the tides. Um, yeah, he, um, he was a very popular individual. Eventually, the feds did kick John Lure out of his house. But it wasn't about the booze. It was the same thing that made the home family have to leave young Edwin's grave. In the 1930s, the federal government was standardizing its prison practices. The Bureau of Prisons was created, and it was determined they needed more control over the island. So the settlers had to go. People were paid to leave, but by most accounts, they really wanted to stay. The only reason Sarah was on the island with us was because, at the time, she worked for the Department of Corrections, specifically in land management. Now, it might seem weird that the Department of Corrections is still here even though the prison is closed, but it's their job to make sure the island remains livable for the people involved with a special commitment center, like making sure the water's drinkable and maintaining the roads. Although she was a Department of Corrections employee at the time, it was her personal connection to the island that made Sarah an excellent guide around McNeil. It's just the quietness, and it just feels kind of at home. I love coming out here any, any time of the year. It's just, it's a special place. It's very thick with memories and stories here. At this point, Sarah is several generations removed from the people who actually lived on McNeil. But that's kind of the power of this place. It can be something that's hard to forget, that sticks with you so much, you pass it on to your kids. Understanding the island life is crucial to understanding McNeil, prison and all. And for Sarah, this area is in her blood. She talked to us about it as we walked through the old prison cells. As a little girl, Sarah would spend holidays, like the 4th of July, on nearby Anderson Island. We have a huge fireworks show. It's an unofficial fireworks show. We just light off a bunch of fireworks. Sarah wanted the brightest, most colorful fireworks, but it wasn't just to impress her friends and family. She had another audience in mind. I would try to get my dad to buy the biggest fireworks possible so that any any of the offenders that were looking out their windows would see all the fireworks and I could give them a 4th of July show. So I always thought that that would be the best view. Some of the newer cells actually have views of the water and of the homes across the way on Anderson Island. When you look out the small cell window, you realize maybe you could have been able to see a few sparks against a night sky. In a lot of ways, McNeil is like other islands people live on in Puget Sound. But of course, growing up here was different because there was a prison. Yeah, there were kids, even an elementary school and a school bus on McNeil Island. Throughout its history, many of the people who worked at the prison were allowed to live on the island with their families. It ended up being like a company or military town. Looks like there were teeter-totters there that have rotted out. Just a short drive from the old cell block, we came across the community center that used to serve these families. It's empty now. The pool's been filled with dirt, and there's no flag on the flagpole, even though the empty rope blows in the wind. The community center may be quiet now, but back in the day, it was hopping. There was bowling and basketball. When we talked to families, a picture began to emerge of life for these kids who grew up so close to the prison. For them, the island was this idyllic setting full of fishing and blackberry picking. It was a place where you were encouraged to start driving as soon as you could reach the pedals because there were no police to stop you. 
It was an island with no crime, where you didn't have to lock your doors because you knew in the end, everyone answered to the warden. Maybe that seems backwards. I mean, there's a prison full of criminals right there. But as it turns out, the inmates and the kids on the island interacted a lot more often than you would think. So we had a bus driver who was in on forgery, and, and he could draw really well. That's Becca Ritchie. Her dad ran the prison employee store in the 70s, and she's talking about an inmate who drove her school bus. And he would bring us drawn pictures of, like, Mickey Mouse, Minnie Mouse, <laughs> and give, us to, give them to us on the bus <laughs> when we were going to school, put our names on it. It was very cute. There's another popular story we heard a number of times. People say Depression-era gangster Alvin Karpis drove the school bus. This was a man once deemed public enemy number one, targeted by J. Edgar Hoover himself. After spending some time at Alcatraz, he ended up here, where by most accounts, he was a model prisoner, and so ended up driving the school bus. So here's how a mobster became a school bus driver. McNeil was a federal prison from when Washington became a state through the late 1970s. At the time, prisoners could work towards release and become known as trustees. In many cases, they helped sort of run things at a prison. On McNeil, that could mean daily interaction with families. After the state took over the prison in 1981, most people say inmates were kept more separated from the families of those who worked there. But during the federal era, inmates took care of the lawns, operated the boats, and they drove kids to the schoolhouse on the island. I was never scared. Um, The ones that I came into contact with were very positive. You know, we saw them all the time when we took the boat back and forth. The BOP years, we were kind of encouraged to speak with them and... um, you know, not to get too friendly, but to treat them with normal human dignity and not to, you know, like be like, oh, it's a prisoner, you know. BOP so. means Bureau of Prisons, another way of describing the federal days. Ann Berkeley's dad was in charge of food at the prison. She also runs the McNeil Island Historical Society. She and others say the only time there was any real fear was when an alarm sounded to signal an escape attempt. When that happened, families were generally instructed to just stay inside until the inmate was found, which they usually were. But even then, Anne says some of the older kids who could feel cooped up on an island would hop in their cars and try to find whoever was escaping. My friend Gary actually had um, saw an escape where the truck busted out the back gates. The guy just totally freaked. The way Anne tells it, Gary was driving by and saw the inmate get shot from the tower. Like shooting him not the normal childhood things. And, but you never felt unsafe because it was always the idea like the prisoners are not going to come to us. They're trying to get the heck away from the prison and they certainly know not to mess with staff. The stories where escaping inmates try to intimidate staff or families are rare. Anne and others say that's because the punishment for messing with them could be severe. Not only would it almost certainly result in a longer sentence, but it could mean you got shipped away to Leavenworth, Kansas or Atlanta federal prisons that were generally considered less appealing. When the state closed the prison on McNeil in 2011, the families had to leave. People who work at the Commitment Center all commute to the island. So the houses, the old chapel, they're all just rotting away like the prison is. Many of the families we talk to are sad to hear what's become of their old neighborhood. When Becca and others talk about life on the island, some of them are brought to tears. Can you tell me what makes this so emotional for you? It was just, um, you know, I see how kids live now. And I see the community that we had on the island. And I wish all of my kids could experience the support of that kind of community. And it just is a happy, it's a happy time for me. And I just, I wish that our society had a spot for more people to have that kind of experience and, you know, be tight with the people that are around you. And that's, um, it was a, it was a really neat thing. The Friday night movies were huge too. I I don't, I remember seeing. But I think there's something else here too, beyond being close with each other. The kids who grew up on McNeil enjoyed a remarkable amount of freedom, which is ironic given that their neighbors were prisoners. (laughs) 
Yeah, I think that, see those benches and the phone booths? I think oh, this is oh, the yard. Oh. At the abandoned prison, Simone and I go looking for the prison yard. We've heard a lot about it from inmates who did time here. So everyone we've talked to has said that the yard has a view of the water, and that was really important. Um, Unlike a lot of other institutions, there was never a 30-foot wall around the prison. Being on the island has given the people who were locked up here a somewhat unique experience since the beginning. By the time the state took over in 1981, McNeil had a reputation for being a better place to do your time. (sighs) Workout equipment outside. So yeah, you can see the water from here water and you see the other island for this call this call is from timothy Pauly, an inmate at monroe tim Pauly is one of the inmates who thought mcneil was one of the better institutions he says part of it was the scenery but it was also the animals on the island having that opportunity to interact with wildlife like that was uh, it, it really made my life a lot better Tim is currently serving consecutive life sentences in the state prison in Monroe, Washington, for the 1980 murders of three people at a tavern in SeaTac. He spent time at McNeil between 1989 and 1991, and then again between 2008 and 2010. So before we continue, we just have to take a moment here to acknowledge Tim's crimes and explain why you're hearing from him. The murders he was convicted of attracted a lot of media attention. And it's come up again recently as he's fought for parole. Families of the victims have been clear they do not want him released from prison. But Tim has been incarcerated for a long time. In order to understand what prison was like, especially life at this particular prison, we wanted to hear from the people who were here behind bars. It's not for me and Paula to say whether Tim should be locked up, but he can tell us a lot about prison itself. Here's what Tim says about McNeil. Well, he was one of the people that appreciated the view, and he says being closer to Seattle and Tacoma made it easier for his family to visit. But some of his strongest memories have to do with the wildlife, specifically the prison raccoons. When when you spend enough time in prison, uh, we're all just kind of locked in here, and uh, I don't know, It's uh, we have friends and all that, but very seldom do you ever run into anybody that's really glad to see you. And I'm going to tell you that those raccoons were glad to see me. I'd come home to my little cubicle, and they'd be sitting at the window waiting for me, and I, I'd feed them every day. Tim, like other inmates, had a job while he was at McNeil, which brought in a little bit of money every month. I'd spend, uh, sometimes I'd spend half of my paycheck uh, getting stuff to feed them with, and that, that was just, uh, I, I don't know if I'm describing this well, but uh, it, it just seemed like a, it was really a memorable experience for me. Tim said something there that will stick with me. Very seldom do you run into someone that's glad to see you. The connection he made to those raccoons is not only very real, it paints a really clear picture of what prison can be like. Tim says the isolation he often felt doesn't take away from the fond memories he had of McNeil. But for some other inmates, there really weren't any good memories. And basically, the main takeaway I got from McNeil Island was never live on an island. Paul Wright was at McNeil from about 1999 to 2001. He now lives in Florida after serving a total of 17 years in Washington for murder. Paul has been an advocate for prisoners' rights since he was first locked up. He started the Prison Legal News and the Human Rights Defense Center while he was in prison. So unlike some of the other folks we talked to, Paul has very clear opinions about prisons and even clearer ones about McNeil. Um, Just from a logistical and a financial and a management perspective, having a prison on an island is a really stupid idea. He's referring there to the fact that McNeil was expensive to run, and it's why officials say they closed it in 2011. But Paul's dislike of the island is personal, too. At least for me, the part that was the most oppressive or rankled the most was uh, the problems with the visiting and the visiting facilities. It was very- Paul says he and his wife at the time had two small children. One problem was that visiting hours were limited. Which made it difficult for anyone that worked to be able to visit. He also says they didn't allow strollers or backpacks, which is a problem when you have a six-month-old and a two-year-old in tow. The visiting room was around a mile from the dock, and my wife couldn't carry both. The two-year-old couldn't walk that far, and... 
on his own, and the uh, my wife couldn't carry both children at the time, so basically meant I didn't get any visits. In all, he found the experience even more isolating, not to be helped by views of the water in Mount Rainier. Uh, it's, let's say, not so much, um, you know, the scenic environment, but the cage you're being kept in. You know, the cage can still be in a nice um, surrounding environment, but you're still in a cage. In the year we spent doing this podcast, we often struggled with how to tell the story of this place that people experienced in opposite ways. At one point while we were driving around the island, we stopped for our photographer to take some photos in what had once been a neighborhood. The houses were all empty. Next to them, there was a playground, weeds growing up, the set of swings all rusted. You couldn't help but flash back to lives that were lived here. And Simone, I remember we were sitting there and you you really had to get something off your chest. You were talking about the parallels. Well, I think what, I, what I'm really noticing is, you know, there are parallels. You, you kind of can't ignore that there were sort of common experiences on the island um, among the different groups, among the people who lived here and the people who were sort of locked up here against their will. Um, you, you look at the, the abandoned playground and you look at the abandoned yard. You look at the both chapels, the chapel for the people who lived here and the, the inmate chapel. Um, you know, you look at sort of the, the recreational center, the rec room for the inmates and the community center, you know, all of these things, somehow what remains, and I think this is the thing that's unsettling. Like, I've been trying to figure out what it is about this place that's so weird and that makes you feel all these conflicting feelings. And I think the thing is, you, even beyond all these shared experiences, you cannot ignore the power differential between the people who were here by choice and the people who were not. I mean, I'm thinking we came over on the barge. On the barge also, there was a van full of inmates coming to do work here, physical work here. And we're both on the barge. <laughs> that, But we share that experience, but mm -hmm. it's very different. When you see them with uh, uh, the overseers, for lack of a better mm -hmm. word, there's just a, a look and a way they present themselves, it's clear that they are under someone else mm -hmm. and that they have no power. We really struggled with whether to use the word community in talking about people who lived on McNeil Island. You can't deny that inmates, guards, and families were interconnected. And normally the word community would be just fine. But the problem is, community implies that everyone's on equal footing, so it doesn't seem right to include people who were only there because they're being punished. So what should we call a group of people who are unified by a place and even some experiences, but who are also intentionally divided? I don't think we have a good answer for that. On McNeil, what happened at the prison clearly had an impact beyond the inmates and guards. For those of us who don't interact with prisons every day, it can be hard to imagine what effect they might have on us or even how our actions or government policies affect what goes on inside. That relationship between the outside and the inside of a prison is what we'll talk about next in episode five, which will be our penultimate episode of Forgotten Prison. Forgotten Prison is produced by me, Simona Alicea. And me, Paula Whistle. Our editor is Aaron Hennessy. Additional editing from Bethany Denton, who's also our mix engineer. Bill Anschel does our music. And Parker Miles Blom is the man behind our website, ForgottenPrison.org. That's also where you can find his amazing photos of the place. Kari Plog is our digital content manager. Matt Martinez is our director of content. Our logo was created by Adrian Flores. Thanks so much to our partners at the Washington State History Museum, especially audience engagement director Mary Michael Stump and lead curator Gwen Whiting. 
Be sure to check out the accompanying exhibit about McNeil Island at the museum in Tacoma. That exhibit runs through May 2019. More details at ForgottenPrison.org. We also get some financial support from Humanities Washington. Thanks also to everyone who helped out with research for this episode, especially all of the people who lived on McNeil who shared their stories with us, the Department of Corrections for facilitating our visits to the island, and Dave Beals, who did a lot of early research. Special thanks to the NPR Story Lab and training teams, and we also want to thank all our colleagues at KNKX for their support. Be sure to subscribe and leave a review of the podcast, and please reach out. You can find our information at knkx.org. That website is also where you'll find all the news and music we have to offer at KNKX. And it's where you can make a pledge to support the in-depth journalism that you hear in this podcast. Thanks for listening. This is Forgotten Prison.